Good evening, everyone. On behalf of HarperCollins India, I'd like to welcome you all to the launch of what is truly an important book for our times, India's Experiment with Democracy by Dr. S.Y. Qureshi. We have a very distinguished panel to launch the book this evening, and I would like to warmly welcome Mr. Fali Nariman, Dr. Shashi Tharoor, and Ms. Nidhi Razdan. Uh, we are expecting Mr. Shekhar Gupta at any time, as uh, are we, Ms. Nija Chaudhary, so we'll just, uh, you know, allow them to join us as they come in. Before we move on to the launch and discussion, I will briefly introduce the book to you. Since the founding of the Republic, India has been one of the largest democracies in the world, the largest democracy. In many respects, it was considered a model democracy owing to its ideals, such as a non-partisan election commission and free dialogue and debate. Its abiding features have been non-discriminatory management of diversity, concern for an equitable and equal society, and a profound reverence towards the country's founding document, the Constitution. Over the years, the tussle between historical reality and theoretical idealism ensured that at times the social contract was disrupted, with conflicts obstructing a complete achievement of democracy. In this book, Dr. Qureshi examines key questions that face India today. What foundational principles must be definitive to our ideas of nationhood, citizenship, and democracy? How may we enliven our national discourse with a renewed spirit of inquiry and imaginative erudition and mid-course correction? Ultimately, the underlying thrust of this book is to posit reasoned argumentation, objective inquiry, secularism, civil liberty, and compassion as indispensable features of a democracy. As the country gears up for what will be the world's biggest election yet, in 2024, this book is essential reading for anyone who wishes to know more about the history, processes, and issues related to not just elections, but also the functioning and well-being of India's democracy. Dr. Qureshi himself does not truly need an introduction, but I will still do so in very few words. He joined the IAS in 1971 and rose to become the 17th Chief Election Commissioner of India. He introduced a number of electoral reforms, such as the creation of a voter education division, expenditure monitoring division, the, international, the India International Institute of Democracy and Election Management, and launched the National Voters' Day. His books include An Undocumented Wonder and The Population Myth. I now uh, invite Mr. Fali Nariman to please hold up the book and formally launch it. And also all the other panelists, if you please. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, since uh, Monday we have been in election mood, and uh, in five states at least, and of course Delhi, is much more in an election mode almost. The, the house is absolutely full, and I'm glad to see there are so many people. Actually, this is one of the most well-arranged book launches that I have attended. The role of each participant is predetermined. Since I'm far older than all the rest, and also grown hard of hearing, I've been given the best seat right up on the stage and named the unveiler. <laughs> With my one-time favorite compare of NDTV fame, Nidhi Rajan, who is the moderator. And the panel, uh, we don't have a full house with the panel, but at least we have the, more than a quorum to, to whom she will direct her questions has been handpicked from amongst the top of the drawer celebrities. And I don't need to remind them that the less they preach, the more we will learn. <laughs> There's a little backhanded swipe 
at one of the members of the panel. <laughs> there is, of course, the hero of the evening, the distinguished author himself, India's 17th Chief Election Commissioner. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me commence the proceedings. The book is already unwrapped and exhibiting the book. Okay. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you can hear me. Yes, I think you can hear me. It's wonderful to see a full house uh, here today and um, I'm particularly honored to uh, be moderating this panel with uh, someone like Mr. Fali Nariman, someone we all respect and admire so deeply for everything that he's done for this country. Uh, Dr. Qureshi, of course, uh, as, as the former Chief Election Commissioner, this book isn't just about the Election Commission of India. It's not just uh, about elections in India. It's very much about the soul of India, and I think that uh, it has come at a very opportune time. It's come at the right time, and we'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, Chashi Tharoor, wonderful to be back on a panel with you uh, after a very you. long time. Uh, and Nidja Chaudhary, uh, one of uh, the most respected journalists uh, in, in this profession that has been beleaguered by so much else at this time. The reason I said that this book has come at the right time, and I'll begin by actually asking Mr. Nariman this first question is that we're at a crossroads, Mr. Nariman. Can you hear me? Yeah? <laughs> we are at a crossroads in this country where we are the mother of democracy on one hand, and on the other, our institutions, including the Election Commission, are increasingly being scrutinized for what is believed to be uh, their partisan stand on issues. Can I first get you to comment on that? In terms of institutions, we have the Election Commission, the Supreme Court, the, the armed forces that we have always felt were above everything, that, that would follow the Constitution no matter what. But is the Election Commission, according to you, and even the judiciary, really doing that today? Well, I, I really think that the Election Commission in our Constitution is like a three-legged stool with one leg much longer than the other two. So that it's a bit out of, out of focus. And it would have been much better if we had a three-legged stool with all three commissioners, election commissioners, along with the chief election commissioner, having equal status and having equal uh, uh, protection as or judges of the Supreme Court, as the controller and auditor general. I don't know why this was a lapse on the part of the people who framed the Constitution, but they expected that Parliament would pass some legislation about it. And uh, although Parliament did pass one or two rules and laws, unfortunately, uh, it didn't gel too well. And I was a little disappointed with earlier decisions of the Supreme Court of India, particularly with regard to Mr. Session because I had great admiration for him. I thought he was one of our great election commissioners. And uh, see, somehow they, they pulled him down a notch or two because he, he, he was a very difficult person also to deal with. But, but nonetheless, he was extraordinarily competent. So I'm afraid we, we still have a big gap in this thing. But there's one important thing which you must know and that is that there is an article in the same chapter which deals with election commissioners, and that is an article 329, capital A, which is no longer in the Constitution, so you can't read what is, it, what is missing there. Because that, that was a very, very dangerous provision that was specially enacted once Mrs. Gandhi lost her election in the Allahabad High Court. Instead of going directly to the Supreme Court, what very in 
intelligent lawyers did in, uh, and those who advised her that uh, we should have an amendment so that ultimately the, the decision of who, who is to be elected and who not would be taken not by the Supreme Court, but it would be taken by the executive who would draft the law. And, and you must read this 329A, capital 4. It's one of the most monstrous amendments that were ever carried out. And, but, uh, but, and unfortunately, fortunately, it was the first time that the Supreme Court applied the doctrine of basic structure and struck it down. And the rest of it was, was deleted by the then Janta government. So actually, this is one of the very highlights of this, uh, this election laws that we have in our country. And uh, despite all, everything that's been said, uh, there is a feeling all over amongst the citizenry that uh, much requires to be done to make the, make the election commission have a backbone and at least uh, be far more independent than it appears to be. I mean, we don't have the people of the likes of which uh, Mr. Kureshi and Session and so on. But unfortunately, we, we have to have people of some merit and we must have some qualifications as well, which we should be framed. But unfortunately, Parliament has not done anything at all. Thank, thank you for those opening comments, uh, Mr. Nariman. I'd like to ask Dr. Qureshi, you know, ju just to give his opening comments on the book and on what Mr. Nariman said. In fact, in your book, Dr. Qureshi, you've dealt with this issue of the Election Commission, the questions about its neutrality in some detail. Uh, you've, you've described how you woke up to anguish uh, on the morning the Indian Express had published a report that the PMO had summoned the Election Commissioners for a meeting and that they went and that you felt that this was completely inappropriate and shouldn't have happened, uh, amongst other things that you've listed out. How do you look at the way today the Election Commission's credibility is being viewed, having been at the helm of that organization yourself? Thank, thank you, Nivi. Uh, let me uh, do something which I've never done in my life. I've never read a written speech. But today I have a few lines of a written speech because they are more mainly acknowledgments and I don't want to miss out on anybody. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, see you all here at the launch of this latest book, the third in the series on elections which I have written. This is a collection of my articles published in various newspapers and journals. Some of them are uh, new also. Uh, all on hot topics of the day. Mostly on the request of the editors. Something hot happens and suddenly I'll get a call. Can you write? In four hours, six hours, they made a journalist out of me, Indian Express particularly. Now, many of these topics keep cropping up. And you will, when you go through the book, they are coming again and again. Uh, so this is a very good uh, reference and handy book. And now the topic like simultaneous election, 10 years, uh, again and again, money power, criminalization of politics, etc. There are many pieces on election observation which I did in other countries, wow. including Pakistan, which gave me a global vision and a very interesting ex and educative experience for me. But I won't talk about the book because there are the, the panelists and she will ask the panel. Um, but I have dedicated this book to young civil service aspirants. Uh, I'm glad uh, Shekhar has come at the right time because I'm going to talk about him. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure this will be a handy reference book for the, the civil service aspirant, mostly up there. And, uh, and for the media, let me tell you. you uh, every time something happens, they split in the party, I get uh, 100 calls, but the answers are all there in my articles. No, you don't have to uh, call me, uh, just pick up my book. But do keep a book, it will be all in one uh, kind of a thing. Uh, its second part consists of constitutional provisions and election laws which are often cited besides some landmark judgments of the Supreme Court regu regularly referred to. So that second part which makes it easy for you, for the media particularly. The third section which is called annexure is a storehouse of election data of the last seven decades. I'm grateful to Mr. R.K. Tukral for sharing this with me for, from his huge election atlas of India. It is a 12 kg, 15 kg atlas 
and from there uh, picked up uh, this data and he was very generous to give it to me. Very useful for all the media, let me tell you. And I'm grateful to all the publications who gave me space to voice my opinions. The Indian Express particularly, because, and uh, besides that, the Tribune, Hindustan Time, the Hindu, the Outlook, Asian Age, Deccan Chronicle, Caravan, The Wire, The Quint, India Today, Telegraph, Economic Time, and many others. Now, but I must thank Shekhar Gupta. Uh, Shekhar, by the way, as I mentioned, got uh, late. He, his flight was five hours late from Bangalore. He is rushing from the airport. Thank you, Shekhar, for making it in time. Because I want you to hear what are you, I'm going to, the, the next sentence. I must mention Shekhar is an old friend. I was working as the director of public relations Haryana when the tall JAT leader, Chaudhary Devilal, was the chief minister, post-emergency. That is when Shekhar appeared on the scene as a cub reporter. I think he has grown up a bit now. <laughs> mm. Actually, not a bit, but hugely and has become a stalwart by his sheer brilliance. And I'm very proud of uh, my 50-year-old association with him. After Shekhar left Indian Express, Raj Kamaljha continued to share his precious space with me, as did Vandita Mishra. I must uh, express my gratitude to uh, the Fali Narimanji for blessing me with his presence and for unveiling the book. I'm extremely proud that at least twice he wrote and mailed to me in appreciation of my article. Just now somebody was asking me about electoral bonds. I wrote an article on electoral bonds, uh, what is wrong with that and what is the solution, and I got a brilliant letter of appreciation from no less than Mr. Nariman. I'm so proud. <laughs> and he wrote it to me directly, and he wrote a letter to the editor who published in the Indian Express, and normally we write letters to the editor, here was the editor writing to me, look, I've received a letter from Mr. Fadfali Nariman. So that was one. And second time, another the piece on which he said, another ace of an article from Qureshi. Coming from Mr. Nariman, you can't expect a bigger encouragement and compliment. Um, and I'm extremely honored that he agreed to come here despite his senior age. Uh, my thank to uh, my friend Shashi Tharoor, my college mate, first for writing the foreword for the book, which somehow I just now discovered, I got the book in hand it only yesterday. He got it today, and we find his foreword is missing. And uh, of course, uh, the publisher has a lot to do. It is mentioned in the acknowledgement, it is mentioned everywhere, what went wrong. Of course, we'll uh, do the correction, I'm sure, uh, very quickly. So first for the, uh, the foreword, we were keeping it a mystery. Uh, um, and for joining us in this panel, Shashi, He's the busiest man in the country today, besides being the most popular. <laughs> now, Neerja Chaudhary is an old friend and one of the most respected journalists India has. My book has the difficult task of competing with her extremely popular book on how Indian Prime Minister decide. I the, uh, am a part of the election of the Prime Minister. What he does and how he decides is her domain. So I don't know how he decides, but I, my job finishes after I've got the Prime Minister elected. Now, Nidhi the, uh, is the most appropriate person to be the anchor and moderator. She has interviewed me on NDTV on more than half the subjects covered in the book. Typically, what will happen, she will read my article in Indian Express in the morning. She would like it. And within two hours, I get a call from her guest relation. She is doing a program in the evening. Will you join? Of course, there's no question of saying no. She was my favorite anchor, and NDTV was my favorite channel. So she has done a program on almost every the topic, every article, and I'm sure she would know the content by heart. Friends, I must acknowledge with thanks my young research assistants, namely Shruti Salaria. Where is she? Uh, when I name, please stand up. Shruti Salaria, Shivanshi Asthana, Ushmayu Bhattacharya, Tripti Jain, Nikita Singh, and Abhishek Matta. Um, <laughs> so, let, let me share a secret. They are all my co-authors, if not ghostwriters, but don't tell anybody else. <laughs> Why they left me after a year each must show that I'm a bad boss. Now you have to... Uh, uh, confirm or deny it. 
Now, my gratitude to HarperCollins, led by Swati Chopra and Vandana, for making this book and today's event possible. Suhel Khan, where is very Suhel Khan, the man with the hat, uh, has been my friend, philosopher, guide throughout this project. And how can I not thank uh, Mahesh, uh, my IAS colleague from Delhi, for co-organizing the function. And I'm most obliged to all my media friends. They have always been so accessible to me as I have been to them. Uh, finally, IALM and its founders, uh, uh, Anil and Malvika, for hosting this function in this, this, this beautiful hall. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Now, give me a question. मेरे सवाल का जो जवाब है वो हां वो सवाल बता दिए बुढ़ा हो गया हूं मैं लेट न्यूट्रलिटी ऑफ द ईसी न्यूट्रलिटी एक्चुअली आई हैव देयर आर फोर फाइव आर्टिकल्स इन द बुक ऑन द न्यूट्रलिटी एंड लेट मी टेल यू एवरी टाइम आई हैव बीन एन सेल्फ अपॉइंटेड स्पोक्समैन ऑफ द इलेक्शन कमीशन लेट मी टेल यू अशोक लवासा इज हियर even when he was in office he would not have that much credibility as i had as a retired chief election commissioner because his job is to defend evm it's not my job to defend evm but if i say evm is dependable people listen they trust because i have no vested interest anymore so when i found that election commission was uh, not doing things uh, it should it was a painful decision for me to write something I uh, try to use all the command of English language which I have, which is, which is very little, to somehow couch it in uh, such a language that it doesn't sound like a criticism of them. My typical answer was that every time I hear a criticism of election commission, it hurts me. But the point was that there was criticism, which they earned, and it was all up to them. So I wrote four or five articles for, for which uh, uh, I, I think uh, one incumbent even did a press conference abusing me, whereas actually if I was uh, hostile to election commission, they would have been in deep trouble. But I've been a defender because I, this is an institution I'm proud of. This is an institution which has done India proud. There are aberrations here and there. So uh, uh, let us hope that they are incumbent based uh, with the new incumbent. Uh, we can have a new expectation. and uh, but. The fact that you raised this question, this was, didn't happen in my time, or at the, the time before. Shashi Tharoor, can you weigh in on this? Uh, I mean, is it unfortunate that there seems to be also a, quite a bit of a trust deficit at the moment, at least between opposition parties and, and an institution like the Election Commission? We have the EVM controversy that crops up from time to time. Opposition delegations go and they complain that the EC kind of listened to them, didn't assure them of anything. There are complaints about the way election, election schedules are decided, the gaps, etc. Uh, is it unfortunate that it's come to that, where this trust deficit is, is there? But it's come to that because of these developments, that you're looking at a situation where there have specifically been lapses, to put it politely, on the part of the Election Commission that has given rise to these concerns. When you read in the newspapers that uh, uh, the three Election Commissioners are summoned to a meeting with the Principal Secretary to the Prime Minister, and they actually go without saying, sorry, it's not your business to summon us. And when you read that uh, uh, in the 2017 Gujarat elections, which had historically always been announced at the same time as two other state elections, <clears throat> that suddenly those two are announced first, and nothing is announced for Gujarat to permit the Prime Minister to go and announce a few more freebies uh, before the election dates are announced. Uh, when you hear about the, the Lavasa controversy where one election commissioner essentially seeks to dissent and then ends up being sort of backed off to Manila, uh, 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 I, I don't want to go into all the details. You, you know the examples. There's example after example like this, and there's been, um, uh, as a result, a perception that the Election Commission has been behaving uh, more and more like a handmaiden of the government rather than uh, the kind of independent body it's meant to be. It's very striking that previous governments actually valued the independence of the Election Commission. It was always headed by a retired bureaucrat, but governments went out of their way to find bureaucrats with a reputation for integrity, for no-nonsense and corruptibility, for people who would not, you know, lightly take matters lying down. TN Station was the the paradigm of that, but Qureshi Sahab here. But there were uh, election commissioners Lingdo. that one could say were, you know, friendly towards the Congress dispensation also. Uh, well, I mean, you, I... I don't want to take names. Well, I can take names of ones who weren't, even though they were <laughs> appointed by the Congress. So let's not go into names. Perhaps there were one or two like that. And that, by the way, 
was also something which came up in earlier deliberations about the appointment procedure. So why not have a, uh, an appointment panel? Uh, right now, as you know, there's a Supreme Court judgment suggesting a panel that would include the Chief Justice of India, but they which said the until, parliament, until, until Parliament rules otherwise. And, and Parliament, of course, means, unfortunately, in our present system, the executive. Essentially, once the executive is formed and has a rubber stamp majority in Parliament, you are surrendering to the executive the right to create the kind of mechanism it wishes. And, uh, and so, as you know, the, the preferred formula of the present government is that the third member, far from being an independent justice of the Supreme Court, minister. is going to be a cabinet minister, named obviously by the prime minister. So these are questions that, that are troubling because, in fact, in many ways, the uh, independence and neutrality of the election commission was always one of our great uh, talking points when it came to speaking about uh, India's elections. I mean, it was no accident that, you know, uh, we have been summoned, I mean, our people like Yaqub Sahab, by numerous countries to come and observe their elections, to guide them, to give them advice. It's only because we have developed over these years, and it wasn't just Congress rule Nidhi, in all fairness, there were a few other governments in between. We've developed a reputation for having a, an election commission of, of true neutrality and independence, which has also acquired a lot of expertise in running elections in a country with the kind of challenges we have that many other sort of uh, uh, developing countries and some new democracies found valuable. Um, I think, Yakul Sahib, you can tell us how many countries you wandered off to and advised uh, after you left being an election commissioner, as well as, of course, uh, when our serving election commissioners have been asked to advise on elections. So this kind of thing is being compromised at the altar of the political expediency of the present government, and I think that's deeply unfortunate. Uh, so when you ask about a trust deficit, I ask you, why, where does a trust deficit come from? It is because of a perception that the playing field is not level. We've even seen this during elections when complaints are made about specific speeches uh, made by candidates which are violative of the poll code, uh, where uh, speeches made by every other party are very rapidly wrapped on the knuckles. And somehow even the home minister is able to make uh, a flagrantly offensive speech and, and complaints are immediately issued, but no action is taken by the election commission. So these are kinds of questions which, honestly, the only people who can answer are the election commission. It's not that we're making a value judgment alone. We're giving you concrete examples where the election commission has been found wanting. Absolutely. Let, let me just get Nidja Chaudhary and Shekhar Gupta in at this point. Uh, both of you have covered elections in India for decades now, so you've seen how things have changed, the kind of chaos our elections used to be uh, to, you know, a, a, it's a flawed, but it's it's a great system of, of electronic voting machines. I, for one, am not, I don't buy into the conspiracy theories about EVMs. But uh, Neerja Chaudhary, uh, in that context then, uh, how important does the perceived independence and the neutrality of the election commission become in, in the India that we live in today? That, that to ensure that in this chaotic democracy of ours, a level playing field is being provided to all. Look, over the years, uh, we've seen this, and this is before TN, I also go back to TN Session. TN Session was also very close to the Congress. He was part of the Rajiv Gandhi regime. But once he sat in that chair, he was a bulldog. He had the prime ministers, the politicians running in circles. They had to do what he said had to be done for the conduct of free and fair elections. And the CCs who followed, no matter what their political alignments, they stuck to that. And it's only lately, you know, the, my experience is the stronger the prime minister, the weaker the institutions in our country. More the concentration of power. The weak, it's a paradox. The weaker the government, if it's an alliance government, the stronger the institutions, the more the checks and balances that come into play. And because for 25 years we had coalition governments, I think it made it easier for the election commission also to function more autonomously. I must hear, uh, I wanted to start off on that note, really to congratulate Mr. Qureshi for this book. Yeah, it's, it's a reference book. You know, he's talked, uh, he's discussed every issue pertaining to elections, elections re election reform. And then all the constitutional provisions, 
that oversee elections, all the elections data at a glance. You know, it's like a bedside book. You must have anybody who, who covers elections. And as he says, dedicated to bureaucrats. So I really must, for coming from a credible voice like his, it's a real addition uh, to, to the books in this country. And I must really congratulate him for it. But uh, you know, the simple answer to your question is there has to be there just simply has to be a political will to do the reforms that are necessary. Ad nauseum we've talked about it. Money, criminals, ad nauseum, one is tired of it. Until you get, no matter what else happens, till you get the political will, it will not happen. I don't expect it to happen. Unless you have a prime minister, strong prime minister in the saddle, who says, okay, I don't mind if I don't come back to power the next time round. But this, this, these things I will do. Shekhar Gupta, just to take off on what Neeja Chaudhary said, in terms of, let's, let's move on to so, sort of the election, the electoral reforms that there are so many of them. I mean, we could be here all night. But what would you say the election commission of India over these decades has really got right? And what does it need to get right? Is, is it election funding primarily, you think, that we're still in a hole? The election commission's got the mechanics of holding an election right. Mechanics, if anything, have got, gotten better, uh, I would say, with every election. And it's not just that uh, counting is so quick and results come quickly, but uh, you get much fewer complaints. Uh, people get privacy in the booth. Uh, I've just uh, had for an audience a bunch of bankers who said, why can't elections, why can't voting be online? In Bangalore, they want everything to be online, right? So why can't voting be online? So it's very difficult to explain to them that online means somebody's voting from their homes, somebody will walk into the home with two lattes, two lathats, and say, you, I'm watching who you are voting for. So it's very important for a voter to go to a booth, get that privacy, and get a sense of security. So over time, election after election, that has improved. But those are things that are good. Uh, and I would say elections, by and large, are fair. The process is fair. There are two problems. One, uh, one is the problem that the election commission doesn't have to address. That's a problem that the Supreme Court has to address. Uh, is it working all right? One is a problem that the Supreme Court has to address, but that can the Supreme Court has been kicking down the road. And it's really shocking and I would say shameful that Supreme Court cannot take a call <coughs> on anonymous electoral bonds. Before last elections, they said it's too close to the elections. Right now, they will say it's too close to the elections. Five years from now, they'll again say it's too close to the elections. So when anonymous electoral bonds were brought in, Arun Jaitley said it's the first step. At least there will be no cash needed now. But what does a first step mean? This is a completely unfair system because the government knows who's paid how much money to whom. Because State Bank of India is the government of India. Government is the majority shareholder, right? Uh, but no other knows. This, th that one single thing has upset the balance in the electoral process. And really, you know, so many chief justices have come and gone since it started. None of them, uh, nobody wants to deal with it. Everybody wants to set Indian cricket right, right? Uh, thank God they failed. Right? Cricket's doing all right. Uh, uh, but this is a fund foundational issue. This is a democracy. Democracy runs on elections. Elections run on money. I was witness to when uh, somebody whose name I shall not mention, an eminent editor at that point, uh, brought 10 lakh rupees to VP Singh in Allahabad during his election campaign, the Allahabad by-election. And VP Singh said, I will not take it. He said, he sent it to Devi Lal Ji. So he said, I will So he said, Devi Lal Ji said that when the election is not going to go, and when the car starts to go, then it will not be necessary to send money. The car comes from petrol, and the car comes from petrol. So that has now become uh, in the guise of making it legal and taking cash out, you made uh, this totally legalized tilting of the balance. This is not a level playing field at all. And I can't see that 
three judges, five judges, two judges can't see this? Where is the, where is the judicial principle for anonymity? So that is the one big thing, because people should at least know who's paid how much money to whom. Because we can then do other things. We can look at, oh, so much money was paid by so and so to such and such party. Maybe we can link some policy changes to that. But all that is completely non-transparent. So that's an issue. The other issue is that elections are very important in a democracy, fair elections. But this is the era around the world of elected autocracies. Uh, Erdogan holds a very clean election. Uh, let's see what happens. So, uh, so there are challenges. So, as Mr. Qureshi, Qureshi says, that he will not, he'll not just be comfortable sitting back and enjoying the idea that India is the largest democracy. Uh, it's a work in progress, but as far as the electoral process is concerned, uh, this electoral funding. Now it's not a question of cash being passed under the table. Now it's given legally in such a way that one side knows, only one side knows who's paying whom. And, and the voters don't know. We don't know who, how, how parties are being funded. Absolutely. And, 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 that, and that's easily fixed. Absolutely. And that's why I spoke right at the beginning about the two institutions, you know, in particular, who, who seem to have weakened today, which is the ju judiciary, uh, as Shekhar rightly said. The Supreme Court will now hear the electoral bonds matter from the 31st of October, not in time, I guess, for the next round of assembly elections. We have just 10 minutes, so I want to, like, quickly touch on so many things. Simultaneous elections, okay? Shashi Tharoor, uh, so much has been written about this. Dr. Qureshi has written about this in his book. Mr. Lavasa wrote a terrific piece giving a sort of point-by-point -point rebuttal to why this country should not have simultaneous polls. Uh, the logic, and so if, if I, sh you know, sort of be the devil's advocate here, the logic is it's going to be cheaper, we are going to get out of this continuous cycle of elections, you don't need a model code of conduct every time, the business of governance can go on, it's just a more efficient way to do it, and we started, uh, uh, when we were independent, we had simultaneous elections till the early 60s, so why can't we do it now? Well, because the mirror is already cracked, and uh, in fact, it's not just cracked in 67 when the SVD governments were formed and then failed and fell at different times, so uh, elections were necessitated later. But now we've got the, the mirror is so completely shattered that you really can't piece it together again, because pretty much every six months there's an election somewhere. Now, the Prime Minister argues, number one, that it's more expensive. There's been a study, I think, done by Neeti Aayog, uh, uh, Praveen Chakravarti and I did an op-ed in the Hindu, uh, after we dug this up and found that the cost per voter would be about 5,000 rupees. Not 5,000 crores, 5,000 rupees more per voter uh, if, if uh, elections uh, were not simultaneous. Uh, this is not a sum that the Indian Exchequer can, can't absorb. Uh, but even more troubling is the fact that the other argument made is that uh, uh, governance comes to a, a grinding halt when elections are taking place every few months. But frankly, that's not anybody else's fault but the prime ministers and the ruling parties. They have chosen the prime minister and the home minister to be the principal campaigners in every state election, every municipal election in a big city. They don't have to. That's not their job. The prime minister's job is to run the country, not to win elections for his party. Others can do that. Uh, the honest truth is that uh, this is a way of trying to press gang the system into a uniformity that is completely illusory. We are a diverse country. We are a country with a number of different uh, traditions, cultures, political cultures as well. And frankly, uh, every state has its own story, even if somehow artificially by shortening some terms and expanding some terms, all of which would be arguably unconstitutional, you manage to have one set of elections altogether once, which would be a small nightmare anyway, given the number of seats at stake and the number of EVMs required and the number of personnel required, all of that. You have it once, what's to prevent one of these governments falling again six months, nine months from now? If your only solution is keep presidents rule until the next election cycle is due, that's undemocratic. That would surely be violative of the basic principles of the Constitution. So I don't see that this is a feasible reform, let alone whether it's desirable or not. Because, as I say, I mean, once, once the mirror is cracked, you cannot possibly piece it together again and get an accurate reflection. Mr. Nariman, if I could get your comment on, on this idea of simultaneous polls and in a much larger context. Uh, 
do you see it as an attempt in a sense, I mean, Shashi Tharoor spoke about India's diversity, but in a sense to homogenize everything. You know, one nation, one election, one leader, dare I say maybe no elections? One president. <laughs> That, that's uh, that's uh, that's what uh, the whole point is that because uh, it's a moving towards a presidential system of government. I am convinced that it is at some point of time, and therefore we have to be extraordinarily careful if we are saying we are democratic and we hold elections and so on. And what uh, Thar Shashi Tharoor rightly points out, the election bonds uh, sy syndrome is a is a very, very dangerous syndrome because uh, it's only the big money bags who can then, uh, with whom uh, the ruling party, whichever it is, whether it's Congress or it's the BJP, they aligns itself to. And that, that's the greatest danger in our country. And uh, because you see, the whole world today is getting auto more and more autocratic, as you will see, right, all the, across the world. And uh, it is time that uh, we take note of this trend and, and see what we can do to reverse it. And one of the most important parts of it is the, the chapter on elections in the Constitution and, and whether, what, what sort of laws we need. I mean, th this requires uh, far more than five minutes uh, to, <laughs> to 6.30. Uh, so it's, a, it's, very, it's a really a very, uh, it requires a whole set of and it's not as if we don't have the brains and the people who are, who are who, from all parties, whether it's the BJP or it's the Congress or it's the JDU, uh, they should all be organized. And, and may I only add a footnote that speaking of good books, uh, I was, uh, I says it was remarkable to read uh, Nija Taudri's book, recent book, which was excellent. <laughs> and it's, uh, some of you get hold of it from a friend read at least the last five pages. They are the most significant of the, this whole book. If I may just add, given, and we've already talked about some of this, given the hollowing out of our democratic institutions and practices, we haven't even mentioned how parliament has been reduced to a to rubber stamp. And, I said we could uh, be here all night. Exactly. Given all of that, elections are actually the only vehicle for popular accountability, for holding governments accountable for their performance. And therefore, to reduce their number and frequency itself is undemocratic. Because the more elections you have, the more opportunity you have to register your views about the government at, 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 in a concurrent way. In some ways, Fali Sahib, a presidential system would be more honest. At least you'd have an independent legislature. Right now, we have the worst of both worlds. We have a parliamentary system being run presidentially. And the parliament is completely toothless. In a presidential system, we won't be able to, you won't be able to have a meeting like this. <laughs> well, that's a different argument we need to have because I do believe that the logic of the presidential system is complete separation of powers. The executive would not be formed by the legislature and therefore couldn't control it. But that's a different conversation. You're talking about the U.S. system, basically. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Qureshi, I mean, is, is it even, I mean, as Shashi Tharoor says, he doesn't think it's even feasible to do simultaneous polls. Is it? There are two law commission reports on it, it, if I'm not mistaken. One was more favorable to the idea, the other, not really. Actually, the, the government report, the, there was a parliamentary committee which says that it should be uh, simultaneous. But you know, one uh, basic flaw in the whole argument, initially prime minister said that the, all three tiers should be simultaneous. But gradually, three million Panchayat uh, elected person, they forgot about. That left us with 4,120 MLAs, 543 MPs. So it is a dilution of the proposal. Then the parliamentary committee and the Niti Aayog committee come out with the proposal. All right, if not once in five years, let's do two in five years. With that kind of dilution, what moral authority is left in the proposal? And then what we hear, look, from the beginning, for the first 10 years, there used to be simultaneous election. Yes, that's part of history. But what happened in the 11th year? Because the states started falling, then we started having separate election. Then finally, you know, among various arguments, there are pros and cons of this. Uh, one MP the, the, uh, from Mr. Mehtab of BJD once said, ask the people, what do they want? They love elections. 
because that is the only power they have. And the money, you know, they said it will save money. Now the 60,000 crores which was spent by the politicians, it went, uh, it was recycled, it went to the poor people, the laborers, the painters, the, the auto drivers. So actually it is doing good to the economy. And I heard a very interesting uh, uh, slogan by a Chhattisgarh girl in a youth parliament in Pune, that when the chunao comes, the garib ke pet mein pulao aata hai. Garib se to puche. Otherwise, how many times we have seen the MP or MLA disappear for five years and there is a poster that says, the gumshudha ki talash, wanted. So this is, this is the reality. So therefore, because of repeated election, they have to go back again and again. And finally, they should know. Now, there are only two or three uh, the stakeholders who will be affected by frequent. Suppose the election is happening in Ghaziabad. Does it affect you or me? We won't even know that the election is happening. Only the political party who is contesting and the election commission because we have to be there everywhere. And the media. Media should be happy because this gives you work. We love it. You love it, right? Election commission cannot grudge because uh, otherwise you'll be very happy uh, the, do one election in five years and play golf for the uh, next four and a half years. We will love it. Now, as uh, the Mr. Tharoor said, Prime Minister went to the, the Karnataka 34 times. And we have seen in history the Prime Minister used to go for a state election only once. Now, if you go there 34 times, 36 times and say that my work is getting affected, uh, uh, you, uh, there is some uh, rethink required there? We have time for two quick questions from the audience. Uh, we have a mic, we can just pass it around. Sir, uh, you raised your hand first, please. We'll just pass the mic to you in the middle, please. We're, we're getting. Would you like to shout your question? Check. Hello. I found it interesting that Shekhar said that uh, the mechanics of the elections have improved and improved. Well, um, we know perfectly well that. There has, only 2% of all EVM votes are act, come with a paper trail. Only 2%. Why is this? There is no country in the world where you have only 2% paper trail. Every country which has EVM elections has a paper trail. Can anyone answer why, for instance, the Supreme Court is not, not addressing this? This matter has been up question. in the Supreme Court for a while. No, I, I think if you think that only 2% of the machines have a paper trail, that's wrong. 100% machines have created a paper trail, the slip. It's only a question of counting. How many of them you count to compare? So now currently the order from the Supreme Court is that five machines from each uh, Vidhan Sabha segment, which is about 200 to 300 uh, polling booths, five should be counted. But this figure is also very arbitrary. I have an alternative uh, suggestion, number two. One, even if you have to count all 300, uh, it will take half a day extra, one day extra, why not? The nation waits for two and a half months for a free and fair election. It can wait for one more, uh, one more day. The excuse which is being given by uh, Ashok Lavasa, uh, your commission, that you know it will take five, six days to count. What five, six days count? Even the ballot papers which were the newspaper size, they used to be counted in one day. Now you are talking of this uh, visiting card. This is the size of a paper uh, paper trail. It's, it is so easy to count. So the number one. Secondly, those of you who follow cricket, in cricket only two appeals are allowed. Instead of randomly picking up a machine and counting, I say that are the two runners up to pinpoint any two machines. They will put their finger on the suspected machine. And if that machine is found correct, that's fine. If it is found defective, count all the machines. So there are solutions, but somebody has to apply his mind and discuss it. One Otherwise, going back to the ballot paper, that will be a very disastrous thing. We have to improve the current system. We have time for one more question. Good, good evening to all. Uh, my name is Shaurya. I am a student, PhD student in JNU. Sir, I would like to first to point out that the auditorium is inaccessible for persons with disability. It was very great difficulty to come to this auditorium. 
my question to you is the, that do uh, electoral systems have a role in, in like accommodating diversity and countering majoritarian tendencies? Like you point out like mixed proportional representation system also is, uh, like somewhere, like Nepal kind of system where we can have for state elections, uh, like a FPTP model and national election PR model, which will counter the majority and tendencies also and give a representation to broad sections of minorities in the country. Yeah, it's a very, very good point. You know, when I wrote my book, uh, An Undocumented Wonder, The Making of the Great Indian Election, in 2014, I they discussed all the electoral systems and supported first past the post system. I explained everyone, but I supported first past the post system. But after the 2014 election, my third edition was being published, I changed my opinion. Why? Because in UP, one party, BSP, got 20% vote share and zero seat. Now that is not a representative democracy. After that, I've changed my mind that proportional representation is a good model. Yeah. Germany has that, but a little complicated. Sri Lanka has it simpler, Nepal has the simplest and recently tried. I think we should have a mixed system. Half the seat should be first past the post, the other half should be the seat. And by the way, people should not misunderstand. Some people confuse it with the proportional representation on communal lines. No. Proportional representation on the basis of number of uh, votes that you get. If you get 10% votes, you should get 10% seats. At least you will have a voice in parliament and that is something where, which has become very urgent. It's being discussed even in the mother of our democracy in the uh, UK. So we need to consider it. Thank you very much. I'm afraid can, can I just add something to that? Yes, that, yes. This is, that these One ideas, minute. that this, these are not perfect solutions because each idea is fraught with many minefields. Uh, proportionate representation, uh, look at Israel. Israel can never have a majority government, never. It cannot have a majority government. The largest party rarely gets 35 seats in a house of 120. And then you have a coalition like this. Every six months there is a coalition in Israel. And uske andar sab hote. Uske andar Arab parties bhi hoti hai. And extreme right-wing uh, Jewish parties are also there. There are parties who think even the existence, Jewish parties who think the existence of Israel as a state is sacrilege because Lord himself was to come and create Israel. <laughs> who, are, who are these human beings who've created Israel? Yeah. So those in the same coalition as Arab parties. So this is a non-functional system and there also one man uh, uses the same system to, to carry out a dictatorial power grab, which is what's happening right now with what Netanyahu is doing with this judiciary. So, so in fact, proportionate representation has become a deep weakness, a deep fatal weakness of the Israeli system. There are other examples. Uh, see, for example, Lebanon, a classic example, a country that said, oh, we have 55% Christians, 45% Muslims, so all right, prime minister will be Muslim, president will be Christian, parliament will be like that. That country broke up into so many that you and I, if you ask me, if I, I were to appear suddenly for a UP, UP, UPSC type test, how many factions are there in Lebanon? I can't answer the question. Although I read about Middle East every day, so these are not, these are dangerous ideas. So don't, uh, don't mend what ain't broken. Uh, don't mend what ain't broken. Uh, because you see people, voters are voting differently in the state yeah. and in parliament. So same, same party which may not get seats in Lok Sabha uh, can get seats in the state assembly. Uh, See what's happened with uh, Congress party in Karnataka. So I think, and all these things are not going to happen because these things will require constitutional changes because once you open the doors to that, then you have a majority government, you will have a, you will have a new republic. So are we prepared for a new republic? Uh, so we should uh, keep the debate to what is pragmatic, what is possible, and what is not too risky. Because these are risks. You open up these things. We don't know where this will end up. Thank because you so much. Because then what will happen is people will then bring out more voters from their side to vote in certain states. I have the unenviable task of finishing on time. So thank you very much, Shekhar, and, and to our panel today. I, we have to finish on time. Dr. Shashi Tharoor has a flight to catch.
Uh, can I invite Mr. K. Mahesh, uh, the Honorary President of the Delhi Administration Officers Academic Forum, which is, as I was told, a think tank for retired IAS officers to please come and give the vote of thanks. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. There are two ways of being great. One is being great yourself, like Dr. Qureshi, Shashi Tharoor, Nariman, Mr. Shekhar Gupta, and others. And the other way is to stand and sit by the side of great panelists. It gives me a great pleasure and honor to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of the forum, a think tank of active and retired civil servants. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm a great fan of Dr. Qureshi, one of India's distinguished civil servant, a first-rate scholar, and author of many books. I am not just a fan of Dr. Qureshi because of his great scholarship and integrity, but I respect him and admire him for the rare virtue of his courage to speak truth to power. This virtue among civil servants is fast disappearing and giving place to conformism. Ladies and gentlemen, I thoroughly enjoyed reading a chapter in his book which has been discussed today, Critiquing the Election Commission of India. Why ECI is so important as a non-elected body? Here I would refer to Professor Saroosh, Professor of Political Philosophy in Harvard, who said that the efficiency and effectiveness of any political democracy is not only dependent on the elected representative institutions, but also on the non-elected and non-representative institutions like the judiciary, the press, the CAG. And the office of the ECI is one such non-elected and non-representative body which has played a significant and a critical role in enhancing efficiency and effectiveness of Indian democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, today's discussion following the book launch has been intellectually stimulating, thought provocative, and informative. A number of issues have been raised and answered. It's my duty to thank Dr. Qureshi, rock star of this evening event. Ladies and gentlemen, I am really privileged and honored to thank Mr. Fali Nariman, one of India's top jurists, a living legend, author of several books. His latest book, You Must Know Your Constitution, is a must read by all students and civil servant aspirants. It is an exclusive, it is an educative and informative exposition of the 12 parts of the Indian Constitution. Dr. Sash, Dr. Sashi Tharoor has just left. I wanted to tell him that he's the Prince Charming in Indian politics. No more with us now. Thank one of our top journalists of India, Padma Bhushan, Shekhar Gupta, sir. I'm your great fan. <laughs> Ms. Neerja Chaudhary, another great distinguished journalist. Her book is a great hit. And I thank Nidhi Razdan, graceful, perennially charming TV journalist for effectively moderating the discussion. I thank all participants, active and retired civil servant, acknowledge the presence of Mr. Justice Madan Lakur, sir, PK Tripathi, sir, former Chief Secretary of Delhi Government, Mr. Lavasa, Mr. Narayan Swami, our former Chief Secretary of Delhi Government, Kiran Bedi, Ms. Rena Ray, and others. I'm thankful to students and scholars of Jamia Milia, JNU, DU. Sudeep Krishna from JNU has done a great uh, uh, help and has given a lot of support to us. Mr. and Mrs. Rai for offering this great, beautiful auditorium and all the gastronomical delicacies served in high tea. Thank you once again, ladies and gentlemen. And I thank myself for thanking all of you. And thanks once again.